I'm friend of the Tesla Science Foundation and has participated in our programs before. Dr. Philip Baldwin of Stony Brook University teaches class in art and technology design. He will be speaking about the Tesla curriculum and creative technology. Please welcome Dr. Baldwin. <clears throat> Sam wanted me to start up here. I'll start up here and I'll head down to the floor. Thank you for the Tesla Science Foundation. I think this is three or four years I've been here. Um, I wanted to, I will speak to you on um, curriculum building that I have been doing, has been funded, will continue to be funded, and so forth. I am not here to explain anything, but possibly the end result of this speech is to build um, collaborations. So I'll head down to the floor here now. Um, I've been recently inspired by the uh, head editor of Wired magazine, Chris Anderson, who wrote a book called Maker, or Makers. Um, Tesla is the patron saint of the new DIY maker, hacker, collab, youthful energy that has radically been changing the world around, mostly post curriculum in your own time. Um, as a three-generation academic, my daughter's going through her PhD program now too, so that would make four years of academics, this system is coming to a screeching halt. The monastic aspect of the, the university with 1,500% increase in tuition cannot be sustained any longer. So part of my talk is on uh, the legacy of Tesla as a legacy of meritocracy, as, as ways we can combine and form and form our loose agencies where our institutions are failing us. Um, what we are not up against is creating a sense of a new monasticism, a new medievalism. So we're really in a, a challenging period for the next 80 years. Perhaps we're on the verge of the seventh great extinction um, as they say on planet Earth, but uh, perhaps this new DIY spirit inspired by Tesla is um, thwarting that. Uh, two years ago, um, myself and a colleague, a Korean colleague might enter later, got a $700,000 grant from the Korean Minister of Culture. Grant writing is my sport, so that's part of my plug is anyone who wants to join the sport and kill some mastodons, I'm down with that. Um, uh, the, the whole curriculum was to educate 20,000 Korean teachers to instill greater creativity within the Korean curriculum. And the speech was called, just when he died, Binding Steve Jobs. The Koreans were wondering, why is there no Steve Jobs? And I got up on my podium, much as today, in front of 20,000 Korean teachers and said, because you crushed the hell out of them. You know, and this is part of the legacy of, of Tesla is that we want to think of him as a fringy individual in the face of the status quo and so forth, but um, the, the times have changed. People are looking for the non-institutional uh, solutions to the bigger problem. So part of this is life in the long tail, which is Chris Anderson's uh, discussion of the way we think about eschatology or, or where we're all going up. One of my premises is you cannot teach children without teach uh, difficult things such as STEM education without teaching them where are we going with this. Uh, one of the professors earlier today said, just don't teach numbers. Teach about where numbers go. We have all had those bad fifth grade or seventh grade math professors who just do the, the equation on the board and say, does everyone get this? This is not going to be happening. YouTube, Khan Academy, and all these um, new sources of education allow us to, to learn at our own pace. Another concept I want to relate here is there's no such thing as waste, particularly no, no waste of human energy, particularly when we do we scrap our pyramid schemes of education, uh, industry and so forth, we have very little waste. And this is part of the discussion, some of you might know what the long tail is. Um, part of the discussion Chris Anderson makes is the digital economy made the long table or cultivating this long tail possible 
And now that we're entering into this new maker economy, we can deal with atoms the same way we dealt with bits. Um, here goes. This is how I start out. Um, incredible. Uh, 2003, it might have been a hoax, not. These are uh, indigenous people on the border of Peru and Brazil looking up at an airplane from the Brazilian uh, uh, native of, 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 of agency. Um, as they found this tr tribe in the jungle, these people are angry. They don't want the plane anywhere near them. They don't want it to discover them. They know what will happen if they are discovered for their own benefit. They will die of smallpox. Two-thirds of them will die of smallpox. They will be poached. They will be put into institutions. And the, the native services of Brazil said, oh, we're just trying to help you. By discovering you, we're just trying to help you. I show this, and here they are brandishing their bows and arrows at this airplane flying through. Two points. First point is, no matter how tricked, we up, uh, tricked up we are with technology, we cannot be arrogant. We cannot assume that, uh, as Aristotle said, the ends justify the means. Uh, often with technology, there are no ends, as we notice with the bad math teachers who say, just, just get these numbers down. Two, this has to be our children. They're as intelligent as we are in knowing, is this a better solution to a better society? To these people, it is not. They will be dead in two years simply through exposure to the West um, through smallpox and disease. They know exactly what's going on. So that's part of the job of the scientist is we must have an eschatology. The eschatology I grew up under late 60s, early 70s, was I term an apocalyptic eschatology, one based on fiat currency, industrial war economies, and so forth. The eschatology I <coughs> contend that Tesla wanted to establish was a meritocratic eschatology. We can fix things. And that's the really refreshing aspect to this new DIY culture. Um, old school, design a pyramid scheme where energies focus upward. All of you in universities or all of you went to universities faced similar things. There's certain, we a uh, gentleman over here mentioned uh, sort of the homogenization. I love the McLuhan quote, uh, society rewards its conformists while they're living and its troublemakers when they're dead. Um, <coughs> Marshall McLuhan, a troublemaker himself. Are we up? Oh. Um, misinformation, coercion, herd mentalities, bullying, authority, addiction. The new um, uh, uh, meritocratic eschatology must be based on a, a certain degree of self-authority. These school STEM systems, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math, all of you know about, <coughs> are incredibly ponderous and difficult and are often not imbued with a sense of creativity that they should be. That was part of our task for the Korean system is first of all, you got your weird kid, your early Steve Jobs in Korea, don't crush the hell out of them, to or her, to make them feel that they are non-conforming and thus they are a waste to Korean society. These people, these individuals, must be cultivated. No matter how uh, 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 degenerate they seem and they're, they're uh, lacking to maintain kind of this pyramidal structure to further. Um, the life in the long tail, okay, this, uh, I contend that the trouble didn't start with the Industrial Revolution. The trouble we're facing right now is a paradigm shift from the Agrarian Revolution. This system of irrigation, pyramid schemes, all that, this 5,000 year old system is, I contend, is coming to a screeching halt. Where each one of us, because of connectivity through the internet, are able to DIY our own lives. To, to hack our own lives to a certain extent. And this is my contention. Um, here it is. This is Chris Anderson, wonderful book. The first book is The Long Tail. He's a little too technophilic for me, for my taste. But basically, and he's the head editor of Wire Magazine. He's entering into this new uh, startup, DIY maker, hacker, collab, whatever you want to call it, this, this vital, youthful energy, which uh, again, Tesla is their patron saint of the merit meritocratic system. <laughs> Basically, old school is this mass market. 
got to fight a war. Pearl Harbor, got to fight a war. Got to make machines. Got to got to get the workers into the factory. Got to get them up there. Got to show friends at, at nine at night. Got to all this mass market stuff. What is difficult for us to comprehend and where we have to change institutions such as universities, Hollywood, uh, uh, DOD, Department of Defense, is in this long tail, made possible now by the efficient and, and uh, um, capillary use of the internet. What Chris Anderson said is most of the economy, though, is still atomic. It involves atoms moving around. So this new maker spirit of CNC machines, rapid prototypers, and now things I'm involved with is biotech and actually rapid prototyping molecular things, it, we're right on the cusp of that <coughs> on a very, very post-industrial, incredible um, cellular level. Go ahead. Um, things have fads. Tesla will not be a fad. He is an enduring icon. But things such as new ways of doing things, the, the sound bite, those are fads that have been sustained and so forth. What Anderson is talking about, we need to make the long tail of education longer. I see a number of older people, such as I, in this room. We will be studying until we die. <laughs> that is the long tail in the essence. Even us old, crusty professors like myself, I'm on YouTube learning new code. I can't even believe I learned code five years ago. And basically, I learned from the young people how to stay up in the long tail. This is old, the red part here is old school university. You went to the university, maybe you found that cute girl you wanted to marry, you had your 2.5 kids, 2.9 cars, or whatever, you popped out, you had the loan, you had the mortgage, had the, the job, you had this. That's the red zone. We are all in that green zone now, making efficient use of human energy, human knowledge, and the necessity to avoid this seventh grade extinction. Um, what are we up against? I think last, um, last semester, oh, semester, last year, I did 40,000 miles in the air. Where was I? Moscow, Cyprus, Chile. I'm back in Chile doing more workshops in art and tech. I was in Dubai last month. Incredible town built on the antithetical ideas of Tesla petroleum. All they're doing is building. They don't have people to fill these buildings. I met an electrician who's earning $16,000 a month while the party lasts. And then went, go to Dubai, but you, it's based on oil. Exactly what Tesla said, don't base your economies on. I was giving a talk there on my famous neurosensors and charting you know, EEGs and things out of the brain. What we're against is we are living in a society of long tail. We have to make efficient use of every energy within our society. Uh, very diverse, and not these, as we see in the news, not these returns to medieval sensibilities of retribalizing. We are all in the long tail. What we're up against is the tipping point, fiat currency going down. The, the, um, the bust in the education system is soon to happen. But unlike repossessing a house, we can't open the skull and put a vacuum cleaner in and suck the brains out of what these expensive educations were. What happens is young people have their wages garnished, which is, for those of you who've ever had your wages garnished, is a disaster. I know young doctors living in New York on $2,000 a month while 8,000 of their, their, um, their wages a month. These are doctors in their late 30s are going to student loans. And they are in $1 million in debt as a young, out of medical school, young doctor. <coughs> These are incredible, talk Tesla numbers. These are incredible numbers. These are untenable numbers. And so we must think of the loan. The, <coughs> the Black Swan, I love that book uh, called The Black Swan. Maybe you some read it. What is that? It appears out of nowhere and changes everything. That's 911. No one knew where it's coming from. There it is. Totally changes everything. These um, graphs and numbers, I contend we have to stay in the long tail. We have to efficiently work out our epoch, our zeitgeist, and Tesla is resolutely the inspiration for all of those. Um, here's my semiotic square. I always begin by slapping something into the semiotic square and working it out with my students at Stony Brook. 
uh, participants in Chile, I'm working on more projects in Korea, back in Cyprus, uh, in Madrid, we're starting a transmedia festival. Uh, my colleague Curtis here, we've started uh, Art Tech Salon, Soho here in town. We are looking, grant writing is our sport. We're looking at collaborative efforts. Spoke to Nick and Sam about collaborating, uh, collaborating working out these grant writing uh, cells to make sure we solve these problems. Next, Sam. Um, this is our lives. We form these lives in bundles. We're connected by cell phones. I was amazed going to a mall in Dubai after flying through Saudi Arabia and getting, going through three security checkpoints in Saudi Arabia, I thought, of any country, this wouldn't have any security. It's like they had more security than anyone, even the United States. Moving from Jeddah to Dubai, everyone is connected. In North Korea, these rumblings are happening because they just started using the cell phones in 2006. No one can hide information from us anymore. The ability to deceive us, like those Indians pointing up at the airplanes, get the hell away from us. You know, no one has the ability to hide information from us, especially if we have that sense of the zeitgeist and that uh, meritocratic ex eschatology. <coughs> this is my complicated program. I'm working with two or three workshops in the city here with my colleague uh, Margarita Espada at her NGO agency. This is my plan for Korea. I'm supposed to be back in Korea this uh, summer, working out these things after school for all the students to make that uh, a point. The, the end result of my $700,000 grant in Korea was, my Korean colleague said, the SATs are so difficult that our young people <coughs> had to study long hours. I said, where are, the, where are they going to get a chance to work creatively? This is my program for after school work. Uh, the symbols are, I use augmented reality. Um, that's a Kinect, K-A-N, Kinect. But I use the, the infrared camera, and I use the neurosensors. Uh, thankfully, at Stony Brook, I'm getting away from these cheesy $150 neurosensors. And we have an $80,000 neurosensor. And I am prime, I was just in a documentary film a week ago talking about how these neurosensors will become extreme surveillance devices. I'm an early adopter in order to adopt these things humanely. In order to appropriate technology, say, no, that ain't no good. We, we need to apply our critical thought behind it. Avoid um, life in the long tail means critical approaches to everything. Uh, this close-up uh, economy, everyday life. I don't know how much time I have. Uh, I wanted to leave a little more time for questions. Uh, this is um, my research expertise is space and information. That is it. I come from philosophy, architectural background. My dad's an urban planner. I come from this notion that cities are the same as the internet. And now I'm working with my research as triumvirate between cities, internet, and the brain. It's very fruitful territory right now because work is being done in all three areas. How do these three incredible things interrelate? How do they look alike? How do they differ? Uh, this, I've got to be a performing monkey. No kid wants to go to school unless it's entertaining, right? Uh, that's one of the sad facts, but it's a happy fact if you're entertaining at all. So this is Aristotelian. A Willem Reichian system of like, how do you tell stories about knowledge, which is incredibly important. Every day is a new gig. We're, we're only as good as our last gig, right, students? And fortunately, unfortunately, every time I walk in a classroom, it's like I got to prove myself every time. That's exhausting. Professor no longer means, it sort of means knowledge plumber nowadays. <laughs> um, that's why I like going to Asia. Oh, professor. <laughs> but here in America, uh, professor, fix it. And do I get an A from that? This is, this is a sad system that not a, doesn't have to be changed because we demand more respect, but there needs to be more respect for where we're going. I am a mentor. I'm your Virgilian guide. I'm a, that's why I get on the floor with you. I'm, I'm Virgilian. I don't need to pontificate up on the podium. I need to be down here with you saying, let's fix it. Uh, I involved the Aristotelian arches in there somehow. There's a new, Jane McGonigal has a book called The Gamification of Everything or Reality is Broken. Some people have 
<coughs> probably here have studied how gamification is the new paradigm. Can we turn everything into a game? Can we solve cancer by turning into a game? We use this incredible program, maybe you guys use it. It's called Fold It, where actually you can make a game of folding proteins. We work, and Curtis is an ex-student, my colleague here, Curtis. Um, we folded proteins in my class on art and technology to make new uh, patents for this game. Incredibly interesting, this. And then those proteins can be printed out in atomic form. Not just bits, like we're using Facebook and all that to talk with each other, but real live reality. Um, complicated graphs, go further, go further, go further, go further, uh, further, a little more. Here's some of my spaces. Uh, because I'm dealing with uh, space and information, I design immersive environments. I'm using the Oculus Rift, I'm using the, the things that uh, Google Glasses is kind of pedestrian to me. I'm using different ways of combining, mashing up different human sensory um, apparatus, usually very inexpensive stuff. Stonebrook has a bunch of tricked up stuff, but uh, often people sequester them away in equipment museums, I call them, where a lot of, unfortunately a lot of Stonebrook is funded by DOD. Um, so we're, we're here to change that paradigm too. Um, that's us, let's show some of a complicated, complicated, I just, I'm showing you these graphs to say I'm not just all talk, you know. I'm, I'm in there with this, I'm in the trenches. I'm down here with you. I, I gotta make it work. I gotta make this Korean student like have his epiphany. That's my job. I gotta make 20,000 teach, Korean teachers not even speaking English that well have their epiphany. Oh yeah, maybe that guy was right at some point. And the, these are my metrics. This is my method. If it doesn't work this coming semester, I will scrap it. I'm not wedded to any system. And that's uh, part of the essence of the talk. Let's not be wed to any system. We're in the long tail. We're cultivating the knowledges in the long tail. Anything that works for our survival should be used. And if it ceases to work, we should scrap it, regardless of our title. Uh, more graphs. I do. I've, I'm attentive to my details. Uh, this is interesting. I'm now dealing with 19th century Pepper's ghost for imaging and telephony. You mount a piece of, of uh, even on this scale, of, a piece of, of, of reflexive plexiglass at a level. I'm doing this with Chile because they're 7,000 miles away. I've been down there once. They wrote me another grant. I'm going back there this fall. Uh, incredible country, Chile, post uh, uh, Post Pinochet, it's amazing the kind of renaissance the Chileans have gone through. Uh, very tricked up, very techy, very tricked up. Intelligent people were trying to establish these um, poor man's holograms to uh, exactly expand uh, the next Skype, the next aspects of Skype. Uh, go further, go further. Our text line, you're all invited. It's usually in Soho. If you sign up with Curtis, you can come in, if you live in New York, we hold these on a monthly level. Artists, scientists, technologists get together in Soho, drink Prosecco, and show and tell. That's it. <laughs> You're all invited. Woo. Two minutes, okay. <coughs> Keep going. Dancers, IR camera, neural sensing. Uh, this is what I, sh there's Oculus Rift. We're showing this in the middle of productions. Uh, go further, go further, go further. Uh, uh, my dad has an NGO on land management. He's an urban planner, landscape architect, so I'm doing work with them at University of Minnesota. I grew up in the cold Midwest. This is tropical today. Uh, keep going. Uh, keep going, Sam. Go further, 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 further. Sorry about all the graphs. This is how I work it out in terms of the reality of the narrative. Uh, I wanted to show a little work, just a couple more minutes. That's the gamification. Oh, here is in Dubai. Go further. Um, these are my, stop here, I'll be outside with Curtis, we can put the neurosensor on, we move this ball around in 3D space according to your motion. It brings up a lot of discourses on who am I inside, who are you on the outside. You move this ball around and you hit Instagram keywords. How cool is that? So essentially we're doing wayfinding through these psychic spaces, part of my next direction of research, Tesla inspired, on the city the brain, and the internet. How do they relate? We have this going. It just did this in Dubai at the ISEA. The ISEA conference is very important, I-S-E-A. 
uh, keep going, Sam, this is interesting, all these, these women in the burkas were using these techie things, and everyone over there using the Bluetooth thing. Um, there, there's so much communication underneath the official crust of society, just like ours, of how people are actually communicating underneath. Uh, production at Stony Brook with my colleague, where we, we blended realities. This is a 400-year-old play by Calderon, Life is a Dream. It predates The Matrix by 400 years. It's essentially where all these reality movies came from, this, this Spanish Golden Age play on the nature of reality. We tricked it up with all sorts of reality um, to restage this classic work. I will now end. If anyone has very quick questions, then I'm over. Quick questions? Yes. Correct. If we're not Kurzweil. Kurzweil has that singularity thing going on, which to me is a continuation of this apocalyptic eschatology. He just wants to mark the time when he can reconstitute his father and say computers are smarter than us, they can take over. I'm, I'm more of a romantic than that. Not, I don't think computers might approach it that, but I think we are, we are incorporated, we are embodied. So we have very different requirements than computers. Um, cities. Cities are prosthetic. I, was, I lived and worked in Singapore, grant writing like a fiend. Singaporean government had a lot of money to give out. We were trying to design the immersive apartment so you had screens on four walls, you enter as a body, you just like wave your hand and your dad, like in Tom Cruise Minority Report, you come in, do your socks, check the weather, check whatever you want to check, do your Facebook, all that crap. Um, just to make a large, sprawling city more habitable, but we need to make our cities more habitable by, by integrating more natu nature and so forth. Are we about done? Time? Thank you very much. More questions later. We'll be outside at the table. Get to my table. Our next guest needs no introduction at all. She's a longtime friend of our organization, but most importantly, she's the president of the Tesla Science Center at Wardenclyffe. Most of you know that through painstaking effort and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, Ms. Alcorn and her team were able to purchase Tesla's former laboratory on Long Island and are now undertaking the effort to revitalize the site. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge welcome for Ms. Jane Alcorn. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be here again. Um, it's wonderful every year to see some of the familiar faces that I've met over the last number of years, and uh, I hope to meet the rest of you while we're here. Um, for those of you who don't know about us, um, I'm part of an organization that for about 20 years uh, worked to save the Wardenclyffe site, which is Nikola Tesla's last remaining laboratory anywhere in the world. And the site is a beautiful building um, designed by Stanford White. It's the place where his iconic tower once stood. Um, and for a lot of years, we were trying to make people aware of the site and the importance of it. We also were trying to raise money so that we could purchase it. And um, for 18 of those years, we were unsuccessful. We were kind of limping along. But in 2012, we were able to um, raise the money. We raised $1.37 million in six weeks through Indiegogo with the help of our um, chief cheerleader, I call him now, Matthew Inman, the oatmeal. And so uh, since that time, it's been an absolute roller coaster ride. We've been really just keep climbing up. I hope there's no downside to this one. 
but it's been an amazing uh, time. And um, since this program it, or this conference today is a lot about education and a Tesla curriculum, I wanted to let you know that actually the reason we started our whole um, process of trying to acquire Wardenclyffe was because we wanted to have a science museum and learning center. And at the time we began that endeavor, I really didn't know anything about Tesla. I just knew that he had worked in our community and his laboratory was there and it was a potential place for us to have this learning center. Um, and so now it's grown into far more than just a learning center, but since that was one of our main goals, um, to have a place where people could learn about science particularly, um, and that's one of our main missions, we've actually begun to work in a science program this year with students. And it's a program called Destination Imagination, and it's all about creativity. Our, um, you know, people talk about STEM education, but nowadays we talk about STEAM education, science, technology, education, arts, and math. And I think that Tesla is a person who inspires a lot of people to express themselves in creative and artistic ways. And so I think that that's really important that we recognize that part of the human spirit, the, the creative and expressive and arts related um, part of us. And so the program that we've been doing with students is all directed by kids. It's all about them and their creativity. It's an opportunity to take them away from that, um, that sage on the stage kind of teaching to the guide on the side, the person who can help the kids to discover and explore on their own. And it's um, a means of helping them to uh, develop their creativity, think in different ways. Tesla was a person who didn't think in a linear fashion. He allowed the world to inspire him. Things, he, you know, when he talked about that, that rotating motor and how the sun gave him that inspiration of how it would work uh, when he was walking through the park and drew his diagram in the, in the soil. I think that that's something that we have to allow to happen to all of us, and particularly children, that we can't always just say, you know, we'll do that work for page in your, in your math book you need to be able to allow the creativity that's natural to children and to all of us really to express itself. So we're trying to start with children in that way, not to teach them about Tesla per se, or of course we want them to know about him as well, but we want, we want them to use their creativity, which is what I think Tesla was more about, was using his inspirations and his creative thinking and let kids begin to do that. So, um, a little bit about what's been going on at Wardenclyffe since we purchased the site. When we walked onto the grounds, as some of you who've been there can attest, it was a, a jungle. It was just covered with vines and, and overgrowth, and I see some people here who have volunteered, some young people as well, who are there and helped us do some of the work. We had to clean up a jungle, and um, we worked really hard, and in the first six months, we reached a point where we were able to host a wonderful celebration and some of the people sitting here uh, helped us to do it. Uh, and we were able to accept the gift from the Serbian government of a fabulous statue of Tesla. And it's now installed on the grounds and people pass it every day. And I always hear from community members who've passed it who tell me how wonderful it is to look um, at the site as they drive past Wardenclyffe and see Nikola Tesla looking benignly down at them. And uh, it's really, uh, it's become a focal point in the community, which, and, and it's become a point of pilgrimage as well for people. I get calls and, and emails frequently, almost daily, from people saying, when can I come and visit the site? I'd like to come and visit the site. And I tell them, well, you can't come walk on the grounds yet but um, you certainly can come visit the site and see the statue and see the laboratory and see what remains of the wonderful tower. So um, the work that's been going on has been mainly the work of volunteers. I mean, I work and, and others on my board work to do things behind the scenes and, and plan and we're, we're working with architects and we're working with engineers and we're working with um, people who have come to uh, assess the property and the grounds for the hazardous materials which are still there. Uh, but the volunteers have been absolutely outstanding. And last year, um, a, a Long Island newspaper um, recognized their contribution by naming them the People of the Year. 
um, on in our um, region of Long Island. And so um, I think that tells you a little bit about how dedicated they were. We've had hundreds of volunteers giving thousands of hours. And um, one of them is sitting outside at a table right now, helping out again. Um, so uh, the volunteers have been absolutely essential to our progress. Um, so over this year, we've continued to remove a lot of the um, overgrowth, maintain the grounds. We have begun to work on some of the buildings. Now, the most important building, of course, is the Tesla laboratory. And unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of asbestos inside that laboratory building. And we've been getting um, some quotes now on the removal of the asbestos. None of us can go into that building unless we're wearing respirators and Tyvek suits. We look like spacemen. Um, but I would never go in there otherwise, uh, in, unless I was attired that way, because it is dangerous. So once that is cleared out, we'll be able to work on that. And one of the wonderful things that happened this year is that because of the notoriety we, um, we garnered because of the, the fundraising we did, um, Elon Musk from Tesla Motors, um, we, we appealed to him, or Matt, Matt Inman appealed to him, and he responded with a phone call. And Matt and I spent some time talking to him, and he volunteered to donate to us a Tesla supercharging station to be placed on the grounds, which is absolutely wonderful because it'll bring attention to the grounds. And in addition, he has offered from his Musk Foundation, not Tesla Motors, but the Musk Foundation, to give us a million dollars, which we will be using. He's, um, he's asked that we dedicate that money towards work on the laboratory building. So one of the things that happened is that on the top of the laboratory chimney, there was a beautiful iron wellhead, a decorative feature that was designed by Stanford White, and it was falling apart. It corroded to a certain degree. Pieces of it had fallen into the chimney. So we have removed the wellhead. It is now in the uh, hands of a blacksmith who is forging the missing pieces and restoring the wellhead. We hope to be able to replace it on the chimney sometime in the coming year. So that's the first step in the restoration process. We'll be working on the brick repair and stabilization of the exterior of the building. We'll be, uh, of course, having to continue to raise funds because even though a million dollars sounds like a lot of money, and it is, to remove the asbestos from the interior is gonna take up almost all of it. That's how expensive it is to remove asbestos. Um, we're hoping to get a better price than that, so we'll continue to try to use the money as efficiently as we can. But um, that's, that's one of the ways we're moving forward. We also have several other buildings on the grounds. One of them is, an, is a white house, an old house. We call it the Bauer House because the family that lived there was named Bauer. It's easy for us to designate it that way. But we are um, beginning to work on that building to create a visiting, a visitor center or a welcome center on the grounds. And that will be the first building that we're able to actually complete and that will be able to host guests and visitors in. While we're on the grounds then, we can actually be a presence as the restoration of the laboratory begins. We also have um, an old administration building. When I say old, it's about uh, maybe 30, 35, 40 years old, 30 years old, I would say. And um, that building is, uh, has been gutted, and we're going to begin work on that as well to begin using that space for uh, learning programs, for conferences, for um, um, lectures and, and presentations. Um, and that'll be a very flexible space we can use for a lot of things. And I hope someday we'll be able to have a conference there that you'll all be able to attend and be on the grounds of Wardenclyffe. Um, and so that's pretty much what's going on. We have a lot of work ahead of us. We're working to get the plans done um, so we can begin getting permits to begin work on the, the buildings. And one of the things we're doing to raise money to help all of these things happen is um, we are selling bricks. We, have, we began this campaign uh, last fall and we're going to close it temporarily as of next week, as of the 18th. But the bricks are, um, engraved bricks that you can purchase, but it will be installed on the grounds of Wardenclyffe so that a piece of you can always be there. We'll be making patios and walkways with these engraved bricks, and um, 
at our table outside in the um, adjoining room, I have uh, little pieces of paper. You can go online with the information that's on there. And if you're interested, look at what kind of bricks you can be, um, that you can, you can get to be inscribed for yourself, your family, a loved one, uh, in memory of someone, in honor of someone. Um, we have some wonderful contributions already that have come in and it's, it's going to help tremendously in, um, in our restoration process. We also have, uh, we had a really neat experience this summer, or this fall I should say. We had a group of Tesla car owners reach out to us, they wanted to come and help, and they drove from um, the mid-Atlantic states, from Virginia, and Delaware, and Maryland, some from Connecticut, um, part of the Tesla car owners mid-Atlantic group, and they came and worked on the grounds and then had their cars on display, and we opened up the grounds for people to come see the cars. And that day, well, we had these t-shirts made to commemorate the day, and it's a combination of our logo at the top, the Tesla Tower, and the Tesla car logo, which we had permission from Elon Musk to use, is plugged in to the Tesla tower. Of course, we should have been wireless, but <laughs> we wanted to make the connection. And, and Matt and then designed that, brought the two, um, the two logos together in that. So we have these for sale out, outside if you're interested. And our Tesla Science Center caps, of course. So please come visit us, even if you don't want to buy one of these or a brick, we still would love to speak to you. And if you have questions about what else we're doing, I'd love to answer your questions. Thank you very much. is a robotics engineer and has worked at IBM. He has also founded the Nikola Tesla Radio Club. He will be speaking about the significance of Tesla communications work and the use of technology camps. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're talking about education and uh, how things are changing now. You know, the internet and uh, astronomically uh, escalating tuitions at the universities and schools are, I think, starting to make an impact. And uh, you saw the comments about Edison versus Tesla. Well, Edison was more experimenter. I was doing the uh, same experiment probably 100 times until he came up or fell on the solution that was feasible. Tesla, as he commented on Edison's work, uh, was uh, actually the true engineer. It's, it's not mentioned very often, but he graduated from Karl University in Prague in Czechoslovakia, and then worked in Hungary for a little while with a professor there at the university. And then when he came over uh, to United States and his history with Edison and so on. Uh, so this is well covered in the books. I was... Uh, very much sort of impressed and uh, I grew up in Czechoslovakia and graduated from university uh, there so I was kind of very close to his legacy and he was very well known and Tesla uh, electronics company that was making radios and communications equipment bear his name Tesla so I was surprised to hear the guy from Slovakia didn't hear about it didn't know uh, but the Tesla was typical engineer he got his basis with uh, very good uh, education from uh, uh, the basic scientific principles and stuff, and then using his uh, you know, incredible brain power, when he was uh, exposed into different situations and problems, he used that, and that gave him huge advantage then uh, you know, over his peers uh, at that time. Uh, one thing that really intrigued me was uh, really his uh, contribution to communications and uh, radio communications. Because uh, we often hear, well, uh, you know, there is uh, Marconi is the father of radio and uh, uh, a lot of other people were claiming that, uh, you know, they were, they were fathers of radio like uh, De Forest uh, and, and the others. 
but the Tesla really from the Hertz which demonstrated that there is a possibility of uh, sending uh, signals over the air Tesla because he was he started to work with his alternating current machines which were basically uh, alternators the mechanical machines going at uh, 10 20 50 thousand rpm or uh, 50 kilohertz uh, he was able to generate the uh, uh, alternating current and uh, and waves and by channeling them through the antenna he was able to actually and he was after the wireless uh, transfer of power uh, between uh, uh, the generator or source and, and the user. So Tesla, it's, I, I think it's the, uh, as uh, Lord Kelvin said, uh, contributed more to electrical science than any other man up uh, to his time. And thanks to Tesla's uh, uh, work and, 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 and using the alternating current and the alternators and then trying to channel that energy over the air, that gave the basic to all the communication that we see today from radio, AM, TV, cell phones, satellites. Uh, this is really thanks to Tesla. If he, I guess, didn't play with that stuff, who knows uh, what we were doing, probably still sending smoke signals. Next, please. Uh, fortunately, Tesla applied the patents, and you have to really look at the Tesla as the man who was working on the stuff, and uh, it was kind of secondary for him uh, to take care of administration or business, as the Marconi later showed. Uh, he, w he was really more scientist, more engineer, and uh, he was actually fortunate to go and apply for some of the patents because otherwise, uh, you know, he would have uh, been giving the stuff away and other people would have been taking advantage of his stuff. So, uh, his original work was around 1891 and uh, everybody else who came after that claiming to be father of radio you know, we're basically uh, uh, trying to uh, take a, a sort of right uh, on Tesla's inventions and, and, and his work. Next, please. The biggest thing is also the alternating current. At that time, Edison was trying to push the DC current and the problems with it. Uh, the alternating current just gave the huge boost, uh, or Tesla's invention gave the huge, bo huge boost to uh, uh, transfer of uh, electrical power over the wires at long distances using very f efficient motors. And uh, so that basically gave the birth to all this uh, industrial area in the 1890s. He did transmit wireless signals, and that what sort of gives him uh, priority. And uh, one of the things was that at the uh, Chicago World's Fair, he demonstrated remote control of the boat that was floating around. Uh, so he's not only uh, father of radio, he's a father of robotics. And uh, with his mechanical uh, inventions, turbines, and so on, you know, he, he has just, just huge impact. And uh, this is uh, what sort of really striked me that this man is not getting proper recognition and uh, with a small uh, area of expertise that I had being involved in amateur radio and uh, uh, electronics and mechanical engineering, uh, I tried to uh, sort of uh, pay some tribute uh, to him by uh, starting the uh, amateur radio club, Tesla radio club, uh, then later foundation and uh, then participate in the international competitions, you know, using the uh, Tesla uh, radio club name and the call signs that we were assigned. Next, please. So Tesla, besides, he was able to uh, uh, channel the uh, energy from his uh, AC generators into the air by using the antenna and then uh, resonant circuits. And, and this was the big thing because Tesla actually calculated the resonant frequency of the Earth and he was trying to use that as a resonance, you know, when the uh, soldiers are walking on a bridge and they're in step, they start 
the bridge starts vibrating and eventually usually uh, fails. So he saw that principle and he was trying to use that for uh, wireless energy transfer uh, through the earth or use the earth as a, as a resonator and then uh, later on, of course, uh, going over the air. Next, please. So if somebody mentioned the way Tesla was thinking and uh, uh, operating, he was kind of kicking the idea in his head probably even when he was sleeping. And uh, later on, uh, uh, when sort of uh, the idea uh, more crystallized, uh, he went and uh, started to work more intensively on it eventually when he got it going, got the patents for it. Next. Next, please. So he had the patents issued. Uh, the Edison uh, later on uh, uh, also filed the patents, and uh, Edison went more into trying to use the whole idea of communication uh, wirelessly uh, over the air, and then kind of pushing it into uh, commercial stations between the boats and radio stations and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, Tesla, he was actually offered uh, Nobel Prize together with Edison, but uh, knowing what the Edison, uh, uh, sorry, Marconi, uh, what the Marconi did and how he kind of took advantage of his work, uh, he declined that and Marconi then later was issued the Nobel Prize with another uh, person. Next, please. So Tesla was also, uh, somebody mentioned he was kind of flamboyant on like the publicity and he was going to different societies and giving presentations uh, and things. And that was actually a good thing because those things were recorded and then when, when there was a question of the priority of the invention or uh, work, uh, he was able to uh, uh, have sort of proof by uh, going to the records uh, of his uh, appearance at the meetings and so on. So as I mentioned, the Marconi uh, kind of took advantage of Tesla's work and uh, he was more businessman perhaps and uh, pushed it more uh, and implemented by building the stations and uh, he tried to uh, uh, really commercialize. Uh, he got his uh, Marconi company going and he was basically uh, uh, developing further, uh, you know, the original Tesla's work and patents. Next. Lee De Forest, uh, he was also quite, uh, he had, uh, what was it, about 180 patents and he was claiming to be father of radio. But I guess it depends, how, it, how do you define it? Uh, Tesla actually started the, the, the wireless, which means energy transfer, communications, radio, and everything that comes with it. The forest, uh, when that effect became known, then they started to uh, improve and perfect the radio technology. So they then developed the electronic tube and the tuned circuits and then, you know, superhead receiver and all that stuff. So if you look at the title of father of radio and uh, uh, he would more apply that he was kind of father of uh, Broadcasting uh, uh, radio. Next, please. So, again, we we kind of coming back to, and it's nice to see that you know this society and uh, there is a lot more now happening and more uh, information is being passed and also thanks to internet that Tesla's now it's coming out of obscurity and he's finally getting perhaps some recognition and uh, uh, 
proper uh, credit for the work that he has done because he's really the, 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 the biggest engineering genius that ever lived. Uh, next, please. So eventually in 1943, close to uh, Tesla's uh, death, the, finally the US Patent Department awarded uh, or gave the Tesla priority. So Marconi was kind of uh, uh, put in a proper second position, I guess. Next. That was the conclusion then of the uh, Patent Office. Next. Okay, how can we uh, further promote uh, uh, information about the Tesla? Uh, so the schools and universities and stuff, as you saw from the previous presentation, there is quite a bit of work going on now, and that's getting, getting implemented. Time. Now, time. time. What I got? How, how long? Zero. <laughs> okay, so the thing is, uh, Radio clubs, this is really uh, hands-on uh, uh, sort of laboratory where uh, people can learn and do the things, communicate and work with radio. It's one of the very unique areas where you can really afford to get involved with. You don't have to buy the turbine thing. The other thing is to promote is the science camps and art camps. Uh, okay, so we were trying to... Next. <clears throat> I established the Tesla Radio Club and uh, we, had, uh, uh, we have the plans to build a super station, so uh, uh, something that what the Wonder Cliff is doing, there is a northern location on the Jersey Shore that's ideal for that, but, and we were trying to get into it, but uh, 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 we had the call signs issued for Tesla, so this is known, and to EE, Nikola II, electrical engineer, or Nikola Tesla I engineer, sort of uh, his initials. They, we did the operation from Nova Scotia, next, from West Virginia. We had some world records done uh, uh, with Tesla's name. This is the, uh, next. Okay, this is the peninsula on the uh, uh, New Jersey shore on a bay where the station uh, is located that we were trying to sort of refurbish and create a Tesla museum, Tesla club, Tesla radio station. It's probably the world's best location is sitting on the south marshland. Next. That's the, the picture of the building that was abandoned. That was AT&T wireless uh, station. Next. That's the other view of it from the uh, north. Specially built. Uh, this is the, uh, the whole area. It's about 200 acres that's flooded with the salt water. The, the best radio engineers in 20s and 30s designed that uh, uh, area. Next. Some of the antenna fields, there's about 240 towers. This is the room, uh, first floor uh, building, next. Second floor, but we were planning to have, like I mentioned, a museum, uh, the classrooms, and the radio station uh, uh, in that building, next. Next. This is what we're trying to achieve. And unfortunately, we had a problem with the township. First, they gave us the lease, then they denied that we had extension, and then uh, they uh, changed the, uh, you know, after the elections, and we couldn't get anywhere. We went there with Nicola, and uh, it was, it's still kind of in the limbo, unfortunately. Next. This monument to Tesla. Okay, the uh, second part now, the. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we got involved, our family, with the resort in the Catskills by Port Jervis. And uh, this is what I'm sort of offering that we could make uh, our resort available for a uh, festival. For Tesla, we have 160 acres there with plenty of parking lake. It, just go quickly through the slides just to show because I think it's worth seeing so you know what. Uh, Okay, that's the uh, area resort, build, the old building. Next. Snake Road. There are churches on the, on the corners of the property. This is construction that we were doing. That's how it looks now. We do weddings now. 
but again, we could do festivals. We used to have 10, 15,000 people on a weekend uh, for a Ukrainian festival. So uh, we, we used to hold the camps there. So we can offer that facility to, uh, you know, for the radio club, for the festivals, for the camps. Uh, so we can kind of continue. I know we're running a little bit behind and cutting into lunch hour, um, so may I ask for 10 more minutes of your patience and we'll get to lunch very quickly. Um, our next guest is an internationally published Serbian-American poet, novelist, and essayist. She's an author of 11 books and has a PhD in comparative literature from Princeton University. Her book is called Nikola Tesla, The Super Genius Who Gave Us Light. Please welcome Maya Herman Sekulic, please. Hi, um, I'm Maya Herman, and uh, as you can imagine, uh, being a poet and a novelist, I uh, couldn't even think of writing a book about a scientist. Uh, but then uh, came invitation from the Tesla Science Foundation, where they were telling me that they intend this year to launch Tesla, Tesla's curriculum in middle schools and suddenly something clicked and I got inspired because I said, okay, this is something I can do, can do well and uh, would be glad to do. Uh, so uh, my intention with this book, which is still work in progress, uh, is to introduce uh, Tesla to the American schools, American kids uh, and in middle schools, but also to go beyond and reach adults who would like to know more about Tesla or don't know anything about Tesla. So um, for the scientific part of it, I also got the full support of Nikola Tesla Museum in Belgrade because I wanted to base it on the facts, on no urban legends here, just the facts and the latest scientific facts. Uh, but it also uh, is intended to be a very kind of uh, a good read. Uh, so I will read you excerpts from the book which is called Who Was Nikola Tesla? the genius who gave us light. And I thought about this title a lot and decided for the simplest of all, who was Nikola Tesla? Because he is an enigma. And let's try to decipher this enigma now. Okay, so I will start in medias res in the middle of the first chapter, which is called A Dreamer with an Iron well, um, Tesla's mother knew by heart thousands and thousands of verses from Serbian epic poetry which she recited daily to her son who was often ill. He enjoyed the stories of medieval Serbian kings and heroes of their bravery and chivalry. Thus, early on, listening to those poems of heroic adventures, he developed a rich imagination that would later enable him to completely visualize complex inventions, some of which have not been realized even to this day. It also helped him to develop a strong will to overcome the many illnesses he suffered as a child. Early on, he became a dreamer. Originally, he wanted to be a poet, as the story goes, but after getting zapped 
by static electricity from his cat while he was striking her back. He became interested in the phenomenon of electricity. By listening to his mother reciting epic poems, young Nicola also developed an unyielding memory that would enable him to memorize entire books and speak six languages fluently by the time he turned 18. By the end of his life, he would speak fluently eight and had studied a dozen, a dozen languages. Just imagine that. Following his dreams, Tesla also attempted to fly from his barn with an umbrella. Change the slide. Um, he failed, no. He failed and failed, but never gave up. All his life, he kept trying to solve the problem of flying until he invented a flying machine. Nothing like that. Uh, how poetic it is to think of his cat as responsible for the second industrial revolution. How motivational is to think of how Tesla never gave up. How inspirational is to think of how Tesla overcame many illnesses, including cholera, as a child. Yep, something to think about. Uh, okay, so we, we move on. And uh, I will read a bit from chapter three, which is called America, Here I Come. In June of 1884, Nikola Tesla sailed to America, arriving in New York with four cents in his pocket, a few of his poems, and some calculations for a flying machine. He did not see the Statue of Liberty because it was constructed two years later. He decided to come to New York because he realized that in Europe there was not enough opportunity for his revolutionary discoveries. Upon his arrival, young engineer Nikola Tesla went to the great American inventor Thomas Edison with a piece of paper on which Edison's representative in Europe, Charles Batchelor, had written the following recommendation, quote, I know two great men. You are one, and the second is the young man that stands before you. Unfortunately, the two great inventors were too far apart to work together for long. It was Nikola Tesla who developed technology that can provide the power of electricity for our households and our factories. And thus, it was Tesla who moved mankind one giant step forward in our evolution. Tesla, not Edison, was the genius who gave us light. If it were for Edison, however, great his inventions, we would still be sitting in darkness. Okay, and now towards the end, uh, I talk about Tesla the man. This is from uh, the chapter 14, Tesla the man. Almost supernaturally gifted, tall, thin, elegant, proud, flamboyant, and eccentric, Tesla was fond of theatrical and extravagant experimentations, and he became a superstar of the Gilded Age. He was a dapper dresser and believed in a dress for success philosophy. He was also obsessive compulsive. He rarely slept. He feared pearls. I love pearls. He hated anything that wasn't divisible by three. He liked to go to New York parks and feed the birds. He famously loved a white duff. He declared, quote, I love that pigeon as a man loves a woman and she loved me. As long as I had her, there was a purpose to my life, end quote. The white duff became a symbol of Tesla and of peace around the world. He had a great sense of humor, as proven by his verbal exchanges 
with Rudyard Kipling and the greatest humorist of all of them, his friend Mark Twain. Tesla also enjoyed pranks. And quote, he shook the poop out of Twain, end quote. By placing him on the platform in his New York lab and then flipping high frequency oscillator while knowing all too well that Twain had digestive problems. <laughs> After only 90 seconds, Twain, Twain ran for the facilities as fast as he could. Tesla was also a great environmentalist. He was green long before it was fashionable. He was a vegetarian, even a vegan, again, long before it was fashionable. He was friends with John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club, who loved Tesla's energy, clean energy system. He was quite impractical, as we all know, in financial matters. And yet, he made a lot of money. And if it were not for his unprecedented generosity, especially to Westinghouse, he could have been the first, the very first, billionaire scientist ever. In those days, very rich people were usually millionaires, not billionaires. Tesla did not care much about money. He did not have time for material success. He had more important things to think about and care about. He had to invent a brave new world. He had to become a poet of science. Tesla was a great humanist who did everything for the good of mankind, and yet, he did not allow himself many close friends or any intimate relationships with women, although many admired him. He was, as far as we know, a celibate his entire life. There is a very touching story related to his friendship with one of the greatest Serbian romantic poets, Laza Kostic, who, according to their correspondence, wanted at any cost to see Tesla married and proposed that he marry his own greatest love, a beautiful heiress, Lenka Dunjerski. The poet felt that he was too old for her, although she loved him back. And out of fear or generosity, he insisted that she marry Tesla as the better choice. The marriage did not happen, but out of this strange triangle, a poem, Santa Maria della Salute, one of the most beautiful in Serbian poetry, was born. Tesla was also a popular man about town, admired by important men, adored by scores of society, beauties who were intrigued by the gaze of his gray eyes. He was living in the lap of luxury at the height of the gay 90s in a Waldorf Astoria suite and counted among his close friends such luminaries as the above mentioned Mark Twain and Rudyard Kipling, two of the richest men in the world. Sorry. Um, in the world, John Jacob Astor and J. Pierpont Morgan, who both funded his research and Stanford White, designer of the original Madison Square Garden, which at the time, in 1890s, was the tallest and the most beautiful building in New York City. He happily became Tesla's architect. Imagine, the greatest architect of the time. The designer of Wardenclyffe Tower. Among his admirers, he counted three presidents. Ignaz Paderewski, the greatest pianist of the time and later Prime Minister of Poland, two US presidents, Teddy Roosevelt and his cousin Franklin, and of course colleagues such as Westinghouse, who backed Tesla, and famed competitors such as Marconi and Edison. Yes, 
Thomas Edison. It is hard to believe that they were not sworn enemies. Not all the time. More of the Steve Jobs, Bill Gates rivals of their time. Although Edison tried to destroy his rival, he also helped Tesla at first and later in 1917, Tesla graciously accepted the Edison Medal as the highest honor for his work ever given to him. Um, he even called Edison on that occasion that wonderful man. Finally, um, the last chap from the last chapter, an excerpt, uh, uh, the last chapter which is called The True Father of the 21st Century. Nikola Tesla died on January 7, 1943, in Hotel New Yorker, where we stand now, in New York City, in room 3327, on the 30th third floor. You can guess three was his favorite number. He had been an American citizen for over half a century and a very famous one at that. He was also a true New Yorker. To commemorate his connection to the Big Apple, the intersection of 48th and 6th Avenue in Manhattan is named Nikola Tesla. But after Tesla's death, the custodian of valiant property shamelessly impounded his trunks as if he were an illegal and an unknown alien. They held thousands of papers, his diplomas, letters, and his notes. Most of them vanished or are classified up to this date. What was left was eventually inherited by Tesla's nep nephew, Yugoslav diplomat in the US, Dr. Sava Kosanovic, and later housed in the Nikola Tesla Museum in Belgrade, where it is kept to this day. Uh, 2,000 people swarmed into New York City Cathedral of St. John the Divine for his funeral services, and a flood of messages acknowledged the loss of a truly great genius. New York Mayor LaGuardia read the text written by Louis Adamic, a famous Yugoslav American no, uh, journalist and outstanding and gave an outstanding tribute to Tesla, calling him a poet of science. Three Nobel Prize recipients addressed their tribute to, quote, one of the outstanding intellects of the world who paved the way for many of the technological developments of modern times, end quote. Um, after a long period of neglect, Tesla is finally regarded as one of the greatest minds ever born. He's called now the god of lightning, the man who invented the 20th century. 21st century geniuses such as the founders of Google or the inventor Elon Musk find Tesla more inspiring than any other scientist from the past. The latter named his company and his popular electric car after Tesla. Tesla makes more sense now than ever before. He was so far ahead of his time that many of his ideas are only coming into reality today. But more than this, Tesla's life inspires us to believe in our dreams and shows us how our dreams can be accomplished against all odds. Thank you. Uh, can you keep this for a moment? Okay, you've seen some images here uh, of, uh, of Tesla, uh, the first one with the cat and so on, were, were uh, uh, drawn were by a young uh, uh, artist from Belgrade, Dragana Nikolic, who was uh, recently awarded uh, at the Belgrade Book Fair for the best uh, designed book. And uh, this is her proposal for the cover of my book, Who Was Nikola Tesla. Uh, the second one is also young uh, artists uh, from Belgrade. Uh, uh, it's a studio, Ringishpil, headed by Branislav Brkic. Uh, and this is from their uh, trailer for the Tesla, the lamplighter. Uh, they, uh, Propose this as possible illustrations. The style is here 
for, for the book. And finally, we have uh, acrylic on canvas from 2011 by uh, Anton Peric, who is here, uh, um, uh, an artist from, uh, originally from Dubrovnik, but certainly a real New Yorker, uh, a pho photographer. Uh, he, he's really a chronicler of New York life, art life, uh, and he did it in his uh, famous uh, magazine, The Night. Uh, and this is, I would say, the most spiritual uh, portrait of Tesla. This was done because, among other things, Anton Peric is also an inventor, and he belongs here for sure. This is done by the painting machine, and this painting machine, which was invented in the 70s, was envy of Andy Warhol. Andy Warhol ended this machine, and, um, and Anton had recently had a very successful comeback in a, in a very distinguished gallery downtown. So I'm very happy to present this portrait to you. Uh, and I would like you to tell me, maybe by raising your hands or whatever, uh, which of these uh, styles would be good for cover of my book. Any, okay, let's go here. Okay, this one? Uh -huh. And third one? Oh, okay, interesting. Okay, so that's it, thank you so much.